The Oracle Network. Hello, this is Lorraine, your host from Once Upon a Nightmare. Every Tuesday, I like to delve into the horrors of the world, be it fiction or real. I've had a healthy and what some will call a strange obsession with true crime and horror movies for well over 30 years now. So if those two topics pique your interest, then please go check out Once Upon a Nightmare podcast. It is available on multiple platforms. And don't forget to rate, review and subscribe. Thank you. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. I'm your host, CJ. This episode, I won't be announcing a missing but not forgotten LGBTQ person because this is a special collaboration episode with someone I'm proud to call my friend, Eric Carter Landine. Eric is the host of True Consequences, a podcast that focuses on crimes committed in the great state of New Mexico. However, Eric started True Consequences because he had something he truly needed to say, something that's been so pressing in his life, he started a podcast because of it. You see, Eric had a baby brother named Jacob. Jacob was murdered. The killer was never punished. The killer was the boyfriend at the time of Eric and Jacob's mother, If you've not heard Jacob's story yet, I urge you to go to True Consequences Podcast when you're done here and take a listen. It will absolutely enrage you, and you'll grow to love and embrace Eric as his podcast family and many others have. By the way, not to out anyone, but Eric is also LGBTQ. Here's a clip from Eric's episode about his little brother, Jacob. Why don't we start with you telling me about Jacob, what you remember about him? I just remember he was funny and he liked to laugh and he liked to pull drawers and make all the silverware fly out. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just a silly boy. He was really smart, like for being a baby. Yeah. He was so smart. It was like ridiculous. There was a little old lady that lived in the apartment. Village. I don't know if you remember, but we would take a walk every day and uh, we would pray, you know, for God to help us, to feed us. And we'd take a, a walk around the apartment complex. By the time we got back, there was a food on the doorstep every time. She would bless us. God would bless her. He used her to bless us. Yeah. We got everything. Everything you wanted was in the bag. <laughs> Stupid Chef Boyardee. <laughs> All the way down to the beef aromas. <laughs> Kool-Aid. Everything we needed was in that bag. And God put her there. She was our angel. She really helped us a lot. I don't know if she heard our prayer or... I, I don't know. She just came out of nowhere. But I know it was that one lady that put food on our door. He weaseled his way into my life, basically, because he was a con. He'd tell me lies about, well, they weren't lies, but he would tell me, you know, stuff to make me question your dad. You know, like, he's calling so-and-so behind your back and this and that. And I look at the phone bill, and sure enough, you know, it's on there. But I didn't know he was using it to try to get me away from him. He was a pro at making himself look good and Mm -hmm. making people feel comfortable around him. Shortly after things started happening to Jacob? It was like stuff, weird stuff would happen. Like there was sunflower seed shells in his bed, in his crib, you know. Um, He was getting hurt all of a sudden for unexplainable reasons. That wasn't it. He was terrified. He was scared. He was holding on. He wouldn't want to let me go. And I didn't understand why at all. It was just a nightmare, you know? Yeah. 
And I didn't know what was happening. Uh, I had a job at Supermart, and you were gone. And everything, you know, he had an operation on his head before you left, and Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure you weren't blamed, no matter what happened. And so I was at work, and my mom called me about an hour before I was going to get out. And she said, I want to go to church. What do I do with the baby? Where do I take him? And I didn't know what to do. There's no cell phones. There's no whatever. All my family worked. And I I said, I guess take him to my boyfriend. He was, then he was my boyfriend. Take him to him. I said, it's only an hour before I get out. What can happen in an hour? My exact words. And I'll forever regret those words. And that during that hour, I have felt so uneasy. I never told this to anybody. And I was begging, begging my manager, please, please let me go home. It's not busy. You don't need me here. He just laugh at me and say, no, go do this, go do that. And so I just made myself pray and say, you have to stay. And I just made myself work and it got a little bit busy. So I was checking out a customer. I heard the ambulance pass by. At that moment, he ran in the store. He said, Jacob's in the ambulance. I don't know what happened. I said, what do you mean Jacob's in the ambulance? And he just, he said, we got to go, we got to go. And I just ran out the store. I left the customer there. I don't know what happened. I just left. If you see the signs, if your baby's scared, if they're holding on to you, they don't want to let go, something's wrong. Pay attention to those signs. Don't leave your babies with your boyfriends. They might be good con artists and, oh, I'll watch them, I'll watch them. Don't do it. Go with your gut, you know. I felt it and I couldn't do nothing about it because I was stuck at work. But I knew something was wrong. And look what happened. And I didn't pay attention to the signs because I didn't believe it because I've known him. I went to church with him. I went to school with him. I thought I knew this person, and I didn't at all. Please, again, go make sure to subscribe and listen to True Consequences when you're done here. Less than an hour's drive from Santa Fe, and less than an hour's drive east of Albuquerque, New Mexico, is a sleepy little ghost town called Stanley. Population of Stanley is only about a thousand people. It's the kind of town on a breezy day you can see old dried tumbleweeds and dust devils blow across a one-lane road that's badly in need of repair. The town is mostly inhabited by ranchers and their families. The nearest restaurant is 13 minutes away in a neighboring town. Same thing with grocery stores and gas stations. Stanley is about as rural as it gets. The morning of February 19, 2018, a rancher named Fidel Montoya was driving down a road near his ranch. He saw a trash bin on wheels that was secured shut with a ratchet strap. This bin had been there almost a week. It was seen before by Rancher Montoya and a few of his neighbors. Idle curiosity got the best of the rancher, or maybe he was just damn sick of seeing a random trash bin near his property. He pulled over, and he got out of his pickup. He walked over to the trash bin, and he tried to wheel it around. He immediately felt how heavy it was. He undid the ratchet strap that was around it. He flaked off some joint compound that it was sealed with, and he opened the lid of the bin. Inside, he saw a large black trash bag tied with rope. Also stuffed inside the bin were rags, paint chips, a hairbrush, and a rug. He undid the rope, and he reached into the bag. He was taken aback when he squeezed something that felt like toes. He reached further in, and he felt what felt like fingers. Rancher Montoya didn't see the body's face but he felt like it might be a young woman. When law enforcement came out to examine the scene, they found a naked body in that trash bag, 
along with a hairbrush belonging to the victim. Later that same day, about three miles from where the body in the garbage bin was found, another body was found. This body was in a gray chest with pine needles, grass clippings, and dirt scattered on top of it. When the trunk was opened, another black garbage bag containing the naked body of an older man was discovered. This man's hands had been hacked off. The older gentleman was 70-year-old retired assistant attorney general named Eugene Carroll Ray. He went by Carroll. After he retired, he had opened his own family law practice. The other body, the one found in the trash bin, belonged to Zakaria Fry, a 28-year-old trans woman who was renting a room from Carroll in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Zakaria went by Z, and that's how I will refer to her from here on out. Carol and Z, along with Z's little chihuahua dog named Tink, went missing around January 18th, which is when Carol stopped posting anything on Facebook. I think Carol might have been a frequent poster, so his absence from Facebook was definitely noticed. Incidentally, one of Z's friends received a text from Z on the 18th, and that's the last text or communication any of her friends or family reported having with her. Carol wasn't reported missing until January 26, when he failed to pick up his grandkids after school. That's when Carol's daughter and a couple other family members went to Carol's house, but nobody answered. The families noticed Carol's car was missing, and newspapers were starting to pile up on the front porch. It wasn't like Carol to just leave and not tell his daughter. She knew he had a tenant, and she thought somebody should be there, or at least have taken the newspapers in. She used her extra key to enter Carol's home. Inside the house, the family found blood splatter and bloodied towels inside the guest bathroom. There was some blood found on the washing machine in the garage as well. Also, a pile of hypodermic needles along with white powdery substance was found on the living room floor. After this discovery and not hearing from Z, Z's sister Heather reported Z missing. A little bit about Z. Her sister Heather was kind enough to allow me to ask a few questions about her sister, and Eric will be interviewing Heather after I've filled you in on the story. Z had a rough childhood. She got into drugs at an early age, which is not uncommon for someone who suffers from gender dysphoria. It's not even uncommon for many who are having a hard time coming out as homosexual. Choosing to take drugs or alcohol is typically an escape from the reality of our body and mind. I'm in no way trying to make excuses for this type of behavior, but I think it's important to understand that sometimes we choose coping mechanisms just to get through our daily life, no matter how unhealthy the after effect might be on us. Z transitioned in her teen years, and aside from Heather, Z's family were not very accepting of her transition or sexuality. Actually, what Heather said was, Z's family was in denial. And Carol's daughter shared a little bit about her father's lifestyle. She said he was involved in high-risk sexual behavior. He'd invite people he didn't know in to engage in similar sexual interests. Carol would also invite strangers to come and stay at his home. Mostly since Z rented his extra room, those transient-type folk, men I believe, would sleep on Carol's couch. This is Z's story, but I think it's relevant to Z's story to give you a little more insight into Carol. Z told her sister Heather that Carol would often pimp her out to men for sex. She, in a way, was his prostitute. I'm not sure what kind of hold this 70-year-old man had over Z, but as her sister reminded me, Z did what Z had to do. Heather told me she never knew Carol as Eugene, which is his given first name with Carol being his middle name. And I believe the reason for that is Carol was rarely ever seen dressed in anything but wigs and women's clothing. There was really only one day of the week he would dress in men's clothes, and that was Thursday when he had to go pick up his grandchildren from their school, and maybe if he had to take a trip into his law practice to see how things were going. As for Z, Z had only been a recent transplant to New Mexico. She maybe lived there for about two years. She was formerly from Ohio, and then Indiana, and then she moved to New Mexico to try to get a fresh start in life. 
One of Z's friends from Indiana had mentioned in an interview, Z told her how happy she was in New Mexico. It's sad to me, really, because it sounded like Z's life was finally starting to come together for her, just to be ripped away by some fucked up killer. But who was that killer? Or killers? And why would the killer or killers do that to these two individuals? Police didn't have a whole lot to go on. Carol and Z each had credit cards missing, along with Carol's car that I mentioned earlier. Heather uncovered quite a bit as she was investigating her sister's murder. Z's sister seemed to be a better detective than the actual law enforcement. Z had told her about this 32-year-old guy who was staying at Carol's house. He was sleeping on the couch. His real name was Charles Spies, but the alias he went by was James Knight. I'll call him James. Apparently, this guy James hit on Z a lot. He gave Z a weirded-out kind of feeling. She didn't like his vibe. She asked Carol to make him leave on several occasions. Carol wouldn't. Every time James would hit on Z, she'd turn him down. Of course, James wasn't very happy about the rejection. James was a meth head, and he often was strung out. Methamphetamine is one fucked up drug. It can seriously screw with the brain of the user and leave lasting damage. It can give moments of extreme euphoria to depression, to fits of anger and uncontrolled aggression. When I lived in Hawaii, there was a little town next to us called Ocean View. It was known for its meth users, and I got to see firsthand a few people meth had overtaken. It was not pretty. Some even had pre-existing mental disorders on top of the meth using, which means when they trip out, it's an unpredictable, wild-ass ride. And who knows what kind of pre-existing mental illness James Knight may have had along with using meth. Anyway, before I went off on my meth tangent, I was going to tell you that Heather found out where James was staying after the murder of Z and Carol. She handed the address over to law enforcement, and they did nothing. Meanwhile, there were hits on Z and Carol's credit cards. It seemed whoever had taken them was using them at McDonald's and Walmart. The time stamp of when one of the cards was used at Walmart was narrowed down and found to have been used to purchase black trash bags, rope, gloves, joint compound, duct tape, and dog food. Then the surveillance video was discovered of the man who made the purchases. The same thing was done at McDonald's, and a camera picked up a picture of the same man seen at Walmart. And since the video was of drive through Carol's silver car was also captured on film. On the night of Tuesday, February 27th, a man was noticed stealing something out of the back of a pickup at the Sandia Indian Casino in Albuquerque. He was immediately spoken to by tribal police. He gave over his ID, which was ran. Somehow it was discovered this name, James Knight, was an assumed alias for Charles Spies, and the man was arrested for a prior APB out on him for false identity. So Albuquerque police were called, and once this man was at the police station, police realized that this was the same man from the surveillance camera and the credit card theft. Things were starting to add up for police that this James Knight may have been the killer of Z and Carol. Carol's car was seized and investigated for evidence. The medical examiner who received Z and Carol's body determined that they died from blunt force trauma to their skulls and face. Evidence found, possibly in Carol's car, was a golf club with James' DNA. This was suspected to be the murder weapon, although some of the articles I read suggested it was a baseball bat, not a golf club. Nevertheless, James was arrested and booked for the murder of Z and Carol. A plea deal was put on the table for James. If he pleaded guilty, they would charge him with second-degree murder, opposed to first degree. James quickly jumped on the plea deal, and he did indeed plead guilty. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison with the possibility of being released after 25 years. This, to me, is a grave injustice for taking two lives one of them a trans woman who still had so much life to live. Incidentally, Z's little dog, Tink, has never been found. What was James' motive for killing Z and Carol? 
He claims it was because he was high on drugs. That's it. That's his excuse. Heather, Z's sister, thinks he killed Z because she turned down his sexual advances. A kind of fatal attraction thing. Something else Heather brought up that I didn't even think of. She thinks James didn't act alone. He might have had an accomplice. Not only would James have had to kill them in his drugged out rage, but he would have had to stuff the bodies in the trash bin in the chest, transport them to Stanley, New Mexico, and lift the bin and chest out to dispose of them. That really does seem like a lot for one man. Possible, but highly difficult. When Heather was doing her investigation, she went to the scene where Z was found. She even spoke to the rancher that found her. He told her that Z's body was not decomposed, which would mean James would have had to store the body somewhere before he dumped them. There are some questions in this case that only James knows and isn't telling anyone. As you probably can tell, Heather loved her sister deeply, and she misses Z. They would tell each other everything. How Heather spends time now with Z is at a beautiful shrine in Z's honor. It's laden with flowers, a few crosses, a pride flag, a rainbow wreath, and only happy memories of Z. That's the story. Now please continue to listen as Eric interviews Z's sister, Heather. Uh, I'm your host, Eric carter Landine, and today I'm joined by an extra special guest. I am here talking to you about the brutal murder of Zakaria Fry, and I'm here with Zakaria's sister, Heather. Hi, Heather. How Hi. are you? I'm fine. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to start this interview by asking you to tell me about Zakaria, about who she was as a person, what you remember, um, anything that you want to share about her. Um, very um, outgoing. Um, Go get her quiet, loud, all kinds of things. Um, Free spirit. Mm. She wanted a lot. She wanted to get married, adopt Down syndrome kids, just couldn't really find her place. Yeah. And Zakaria wasn't born in New Mexico, right? No. um, We were all born in Ohio. Okay. That's our hometown. And what brought you to New Mexico? My mom moved here uh, when I was in high school. Um, So after I had my firstborn um, we kind of all followed. And Zakaria, I know, was transgender. Yes. And there's there's a lot of people that have opinions about that. And I just want to say right now that if you have strong opinions about that, um, you can keep those to yourself because it, it really has nothing to do with anything. Zakaria was brutally murdered. Zakaria is a human being and Zakaria deserves respect no matter what you think. So um, if you have a problem with that, you can turn it off. You can stop listening right now. That's okay. Um, But we're here to talk about this case because it's important to highlight the issues in New Mexico, especially as they relate to crime and and repeat offenders and the justice system. And so that's why I asked you to be here today. Anything else you want to share about Zakaria, about your relationship? We were very close. Um, We did everything together. She was my supporter when I got a divorce and, you know, had to find myself. We talked a lot. We've had a lot of bonding moments. Um, Zakaria did suffer from drug abuse. So there was a lot of nights where I would stay up and hold her when she was relapsing. Just very, we were always together. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know sometimes people will like to use you know, whether it's the person's gender identity or the person struggles with mental health or the person struggles with drug addiction to kind of write off the fact that they were murdered. And I, I've been very clear on this show that that's not something that I tolerate. Everybody has the right to live their life, no matter what their struggles are, no matter what challenges they're going through. It's just such a cold hearted way of looking at people and mm-hmm. treating people. And so, again, if that's your position, feel free to turn this off and move on. I, I just, I can't say that enough. We often see, I think, in the transgender community, some some significant challenges with mental health and, and with drug abuse. And, and even, you know, the risk of, of death yes. is much higher than it is for the general public. And it's a very challenging life, just trying to discover who you are, I think. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that it, even with certain jobs, um, just going out in public. Um, even when we would, you know, go out on our weekends or what have you, um, there was many times that 
I would be wanting to fight the world because of the Snickers or um, comments said under the breath out in public. Yeah. So um, it's 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 bad. It's bad here. It is bad. Yeah, it is bad. And it's it's not OK. No, it's not. So let's talk about what led up to Zakaria's murder, if you if you can. Um, well, it was typical, um, you know, around the holidays, I would take, you know, Thanksgiving, whatever is left over. A, a, a lot of times I took meals over um, for Zakaria and Carol and um, Thanksgiving was normal. Christmas was normal. I know around Christmas, it's very emotional for Zakaria. So I think that there was, um, yeah, there was drug use around the holidays. Um, and then there was a time um, in December, you know, that she had texted me and um, asked if I had um, any more of the desserts and what have you, and that she had been clean for two weeks and she was really hungry. And I, you know, I told her, you know, I'll be over in a little bit. Um, drop some food off. It would have been right before New Year's. That was the last time I physically seen her other than, you know, messages via the text or, you know, on social media. I did notice on January 17th, she had posted um, an ad to sell one of her old phones. And I'm like, oh, well, she must need money. Um, didn't say anything couple days go by haven't heard anything no nothing on social media Mm -hmm. nothing and then on january 29th my younger sister had reached out to me and said hey do you know who this is um i guess carol's son um had messaged her and said that uh, we need to get in contact with them well i didn't call i went straight to the house okay and csi was there that was the day that I had filed uh, the missing person because I knew I hadn't physically seen her since, you know, the first of the year, but hadn't no social contact whatsoever since the 17th of January. So you knew something was wrong. I knew. I knew just with um, it was weird. It was just like this strange gut feeling when I pulled up. Just things weren't right. I knew something. I, I knew she was gone. So... Zakaria was living with her roommate at the time. Yes. Her roommate was also murdered. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about the investigation? What happened with that? I know that you were very involved. Yes, I had filed the missing persons. They asked lots of questions. Um, I had to try to, well, I did get into all of her accounts. I turned in all usernames, passwords. Um, I do know that... James had, the killer had um, used Carol's credit cards to buy the supplies to get rid of the bodies. Um, He was also using the credit cards to buy food, what have you, just anything. But when the, when it came on the news and I seen his face for the first time, I was like, well, who is this guy? So I wasn't getting any answers from the justice system. They had nothing. And then they said, well, it's an ongoing investigation. I can't tell you anything. And I'm like, well, you're talking about my sibling. What what do you mean you can't tell me anything? And they were like, well, and I asked, I'm like, well, who is this guy? Do you have any idea? They were like, we don't know. That's why we aired it on the news. So that's when I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to social media. It can be your best friend and it can be the devil. So Mm -hmm. I was like, it won't hurt to try. And I was just, you know, posting stuff all the time, asking, you know, does anybody know this person? And after five days, no sleep, I wasn't eating. I finally got a message in my inbox um, from the killer's sister stating she knew where he was. And she gave me the information and I had then turned it into the police. Um, To me, it was like they didn't act fast enough. Right. Like, what were they waiting on? They had everything. They had the vehicle. They had the murder weapon. They had DNA. They had everything. They had his DNA? Yes. Yeah. Is that how they identified who he was? I would or? naturally assume yes. Okay. Or through fingerprints or something, right? I, I, the, his DNA was on the golf club that he used to, to kill them. It was blunt force trauma to the head. That's how both passed away. Um, just 
you know, I don't want to say hearsay, but Claudia Zakaria's mother had indicated that um, when she went to get the things out of the house, um, that the altercation started in the room. But the murder happened probably in the bathroom because that's where everything was. Mm. So I that that's all I know. Um, I, I do know that there was a huge pile of um, blood in the garage, but we don't we don't know what it's from. The rancher that found Zakaria's body um, indicated that her body wasn't decomposed because when he knocked over the trash can that she was dumped in. He said that her feet were still soft to the touch, still pink. From what he could tell, she was wrapped in a black trash bag. She was naked um, with rope around her. He had made the comment that he thought that her hairbrush was in there, in the trash can. She was left, I should not say left, she was dumped under a tree in a trash can that he tried to seal with the merchandise that he bought from Walmart, with his roommate's credit. It was about a month before they found their bodies in Stanley. Zakaria's body was found first, and then Carol's was found a couple streets up. Difference is Zakaria's, she was, what the rancher told me, he didn't see any blood, dumped in a trash can head first, wrapped in a black trash bag in a fetal position with rope around her. Carol's body was mutilated. Um, his hands were cut off. He was also naked. However, his body was stuffed in a trunk and left on the side of the I mean, the the level of inhumanity and depravity that it takes to do something like that is just mind boggling. Yeah. I had um I was not happy with the justice system here. I had a lot of questions. I asked for them to do a rape kit. I asked all the questions you could possibly ask. And I was always told, well, it's an open investigation and I can't disclose any information. I was hoping it would go to trial. Even though it was gruesome, it would have given me some kind of closure to know what actually happened. Yeah. But I was told that James Knight said that it was because of drugs. That was his excuse. That was his excuse. And um, I also heard that they think that he wasn't the only one involved. Um, Carol was a pretty big individual and there's yeah. no possible way. I was thinking about that. I remember seeing the photos of, of both of them and you know, I don't think Zakaria was very big in terms of height and tall. Yeah. Tall but, but skinny. Not, but not like muscular, but it seemed like the like Carol was, was a larger yes. person. And so it just didn't seem likely to me that that was just He was the only no, I, I think there was someone else involved. Do you think that his story is 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 a hundred percent what happened, or do you think there's there may be more to it? A whose story, James? Mm -hmm. I think he's a compulsive liar. I know that there's more. Zakaria told me at one point in time that the person that is sleeping on the couch makes her feel uncomfortable, and she asked Carol to remove them um, because she didn't. She got a bad vibe. I I personally think that. It was a fatal attraction. Mm. James had previously dated transgender individuals. So just knowing that Zakaria wasn't comfortable, it, you know what I mean? It, I think something happened Yeah. Um, and he attacked her. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't a good ending. It, it's interesting that you talk about Zakaria's kind of gut reaction to this person it's it's something that i've i've noticed in a lot of these stories that i've covered it's people will generally can kind of tell mm -hmm. you know it was the same thing with my mom and and her ex-husband at the time she had that gut feeling that something was wrong but she couldn't put her finger on it i think it's important for my listeners and for everybody to to trust that yes you know that that it, it's usually somebody you know and 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 that feeling, while it doesn't make sense logically, there's there's a genetic, there's a it's built into our DNA that ability to sense when danger is near, and even though you can't rationalize it, that doesn't mean it's not real. And so I think that it's really important for everybody to just trust that feeling that you get, because 
it's trying to tell you something. Yeah. It even um, I, I had bought uh, Zakaria um, a little Chowini. Mm -hmm. um, we named her Tinkerbell. And uh, Zakaria indicated that Tinkerbell did not like him. Um, and there was a reason. And I even asked the cops, well, did you find Tinkerbell? Was Tinkerbell with Zakaria's body? We have no idea. They they never, ongoing investigation. I'm sorry, I can't answer those questions for you. Were you able to ever get any of the police records? No. I requested them. And so if I get them, I will share them with you. Okay. They take forever. I was hoping I would have them before this. Yeah. But I haven't even heard anything and it's been like two months. No, I'm sure. So if, if I get anything, I'll, I'll give it to you. Great. Okay. Yeah. So, so we know that, okay, so they identified him, but they found him. All right. So you found him first. You mm -hmm. told the police, you found James, you knew where he was. Yes. But that, that wasn't what led to his arrest. What actually led to his arrest? He was at Sandia Casino, um, snooping in people's car windows. And that's how he got picked up. So somebody called, multiple people probably called to say that he was looking in people's cars. And that's why the police picked him up, not yes. because of the murder. Not because of the murder. And not because you told them where he was living. That is baffling. I, I don't even think that there's a word for what that is. It's frustrating. It's maddening. It's, it's everything. makes me sick. It's wrong. On so many levels. On every level, I think it's wrong because you have two people killed here. Like, what are you doing? So he's arrested and then he's eventually charged with the murders? Yes. Okay. And the DA works out a plea deal. A disgusting plea deal. Yeah. With the other family, with Carol's family. I would assume yes, because they did not want it to go to trial. Um, but they also had called Claudia, which is Zakaria's mother, and asked if that was okay. And of course, she was one of the ones that were in denial. Um, About Zakaria's gender? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it didn't go as Zakaria and I planned. It was like an ill will, like he always or she always knew that she wasn't going to live forever. So she always said, uh, if something was ever to happen, these are my wishes. Well, her mother's wishes were different. Um, so it's not how she wanted it in the end. I'm so sorry. It's hard. She wanted her ashes spread in Indiana and... She was buried a he in Fredericksburg, Ohio. Uh, our obituary out here for her family out here. We closed with she lived her best life, whereas the obituary back home was he was laid to rest. So it was a big slap in the face for me. I have so many things that I want to say, but I know none of it is going to be enough. None of it's going to make it better. All I can say is that I'm so sorry. It's a it's a struggle when you're so close to somebody and then they're just taken away. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being so honest and open. My heart just breaks because I I know the pain. I don't know the exact pain because you know my my brother was a baby, but I know the pain of losing somebody you love so much. Yeah. And it, know, it's hard. And I know what it feels like to be gaslit and mistreated by the justice system, too. I was appalled. I couldn't believe it. I even posted on um, Sakaria's Facebook page after the reading. I, I just, I was totally beside myself. I couldn't, I, I just like, how, how can, how can this happen? That, that was my question. How can this be? How can a person murder two people and only get 46 years and six months, 16 years and six months suspended with a mandatory of 30 years at 85%? It's, it makes me sick to my stomach because it, it was brutal. He beat them with a, a golf club. It was prolonged and torturous yeah yeah and the sentence definitely doesn't match the brutality that he committed yeah or the disregard that he had for them yeah it, it was ridiculous I, I it was insane i could not even believe it and all of this was was done to 
prevent a trial to prevent things coming out in the open. Yes. What would you like to see change in New Mexico? We'll start in New Mexico and then we'll go bigger. (laughs) After this happened, I am a firm believer in eye for eye. Um, It was like my soul was ripped from me. I wanted him to feel the pain that they felt. Our justice system is a joke. Is a joke. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't believe. Like, I know that there's no life here. You know what I mean? I just don't understand the concept of how selling dope is worse than taking someone's life. I, I just, I can't grasp that. It's completely backwards, I think. When you think about the fact that If you've got people in jail for a longer period of time for selling pot, which, you know, people have their opinions. It's going to be legalized, mind you. (laughs) People have their opinions about pot, but pot is, as it pertains to drugs, it is not even close to things like heroin or meth or any of those other drugs that that do lead to violence. Correct. Um, And you're talking about jail overcrowding, but you are locking people up for relatively victimless crimes. They're taking up spaces and you're releasing people who are violent offenders, repeat offenders, letting them continue to offend, yep. uh, catch and release over and over again. I, I don't know what they expect is going to happen because this is, we're living this like you're living this. I'm living this. We have countless families that are having to deal with the loss, unnecessary loss of people that they loved. Because the justice system is so inept Mm -hmm. and unable to be what it needs to be for the people. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane. Um, even when I called, I'm like, well, you know, did you get this? Well, you know, your case is not our only case. I understand that, but I deserve answers just like they deserve answers. Mm -hmm. What upset me was whenever I had answers, they couldn't answer them. But if they needed information, I was the first person they called. So it wasn't really a two-way street. It was more a one-way. So it, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. And like, I, I just, I still have answers. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What happens when he gets out? Because I was there every day staring in his face and I won't back down. I'm not afraid. You know what I mean? I sat out his, outside his house. I'm not afraid. But in the same breath, I'm like, okay, are they going to come? Where are they? Why Why can I sit here and they can't? Well, and, and the other problem is you shouldn't have to worry about him. Not that you are worried, but you shouldn't have to. That shouldn't be a thing right. when somebody does what he did. Exactly. They should be locked up forever. Forever. Or... You know, if we're not going to have the death penalty, let's at least have a real life sentence. Right. 30 years is not nothing enough. That's like 15, 15 years per per life he took. And so how long or how old will he be if he gets out in 30 at 30 years? Oh, I don't even know how old he is. I didn't even care. I just know that I mean, he changed. He'll probably be in his 50s or 60s, maybe. Probably. So he'd still be able to do life. Whatever somewhat. he wants. Yeah. Well, if he's not in trouble again, because right. he did legally change his name. Why? I could not find the answers to why. He changed his name to James Knight, but he did he did legally change his name. That's weird. What else do you want my listeners to know? Listen. Listen to your family members when they tell you that they feel something. Trust what they're telling you is true. You can avoid this situation. What would you like to see change with regards to laws or how police deal with family members. Um, well, just like, you know, they want to open book. We need answers because if they were in trouble and, you know, they got their one phone call, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They rely on you. It, the respect has to be also given. Yeah. Like I have answers for a lot of things that what I put in my head that, probably happened i have i think i know who the other person was involved won't tell them sure i won't tell them for what what have they given me right i went to the morgue every day and they wouldn't tell me if if she was there 
all because it was an open case. But yet I needed to tell them what tattoos she had, what she looked like, how tall she was, how, how much she weighed. I mean, I understand they need information, but I should have gotten something back. Some kind of closure, because I just don't know. I think that that acknowledgement, people don't realize in, in the justice system, in the police department, how important that is. The acknowledgement of of who the family is and, and what they're going through. Um, you know, like just the fact that if they could just say, like, I know this is hard for you. Here's what I can tell you. Like th that would be worth so much. I think I was kind of left in the dark um, because Carol's family, um, you know, he was a retired attorney mm -hmm. and they had their own firm. So I'm sure they got all of the answers. Whereas Zakaria's family is left to wonder, which is baffling because they have closure. We don't. Yeah, and they, they were obviously satisfied with the plea deal. Is there anything else that you want to say? No, just listen. Listen. I think that you are are incredibly brave. I admire your strength so much. I know how hard it is to fight this fight every day and to live with all these questions and no answers. And so I want to thank you for being willing to talk about it. And I believe that you are honoring Zakaria's memory by continuing to stand up for what's right. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Even when I go out to the site where her body was found, it's my moment, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't have those conversations like we used to. So I know she knows that I'm there because before I leave, it's always, it'll get windy or something crazy will happen. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I I know she's there. It's just um, it's just hard when the justice system doesn't work for you, because you're always left. Well, what if? You know what I mean? Well, what if this happened? Mm -hmm. So it it's it's really hard, because I I think that you know after sentencing or what have you, and it's public record, it should be given first. That should be their number one priority. And I have yet to get anything. Thank you for for sharing Zakaria's story with us. And if anybody wants to contact you, are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Okay. Do you want to give that information? Um, yeah, my um, name is Heather Patton. Um, it's P-A-T-T-E-N. Um, I'm on Facebook. I don't do all those other... <laughs> <laughs> How many do they have now? <laughs> so many. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can reach out. Thank you. And thanks for listening and stay safe, New Mexico. Thanks so much, Rainbow Warriors, for listening to my and Eric's collaboration. I love you guys. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. <laughs> <laughs>